you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tim. As always, great job. Appreciate you kind of setting the, the tone for the service and giving the liberty to the Holy Spirit to move and minister through the worship and through the preaching of the Word. And we thank Suzanne and Tim and Tammy for leading us in worship this morning. Praise the Lord. Again, God bless you for being here. Thanks. I know it's spring break, obviously. We're looking at uh, lots of people out of town. and We've got people in Puerto Rico. We've got people in uh, South Carolina. We have a, a worldwide ministry here, praise the Lord. And, uh, but they're not here. That's the problem. No, but that's great. We understand uh, spring break, get a vacation, get away every once in a while. It's all good. Praise the Lord. But we appreciate those of you that decided to stick it out here in the beautiful state of Iowa. Hallelujah. I said that by faith, too, praise the Lord. I uh, just wanted to mention, I, I, I intended to do this last week, but for whatever reason, I got caught up in something else and forgot. But Yvette is still on for this clothing drive, and the, uh, call it whatever you want to, uh, closed closet, uh, just going to be an open door to people to come, uh, get any kind of clothing that we may have available to give to them, to use for themselves, for family members, for friends, for whoever they can uh, get it to. And uh, I appreciate Yvette's uh, burden for this and feeling like being led of the Lord. And that's what it's all about. And uh, anytime somebody feels like God's speaking to him, we need to act. That's what Tim was talking about this morning. It's one thing to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then when he tells you and it's not what you uh, really wanted to do, I mean, maybe you're not into a clothes closet. But God is, praise the Lord, or he wouldn't have laid it on Yvette. So, so uh, be thinking about it. Go through your, uh, your, you know, your winter clothes, your summer clothes, your spring clothes, whatever you may have. If you're like me, you've got stuff you've had for 20 years that just gets put in a tote and then gets moved back and forth and back and forth. And the beauty of that is my clothes have never gone out of style because I haven't changed since 1960. So praise the Lord. <laughs> praise God. But anyway, if you have things that you're not wearing that are just sitting around and causing you to have to load and unload and move around, bring them. Uh, by next Saturday, uh, by the first Saturday of, uh, of April. So you can bring them any time. Uh, we'll say the week prior, because we don't want a lot of stuff just piled up downstairs in the way. But if you want to bring them that last week of March, and we'll have them here for that first Saturday in April, and then if you know people that you know may uh, have an issue, or they may know somebody that does, let them know about it. Tell them that it'll, it'll be available here, and we'll get the times and everything out to you. If you have questions, though, just speak to Yvette. And she'll, she'll give you the information you need, and we'll try to get some, maybe some flyers or something out around here. And I'm going to be making flyers out this week, so I'll have them next week. All right. Yeah, that'll be great. So next Sunday when we come, you want to pick up a few of those, you can drop them off at some of the places you hang out. Or maybe just give them to a friend or stick them on a neighbor's door, or whatever. Any, any, anything will work, praise God. So we want, to, we want to support Yvette, and by doing that, we're supporting the Lord. And... Uh, being obedient to him. Amen? Okay, praise the Lord. I've been reading a really good book. <clears throat> I may have told you about this one before. It's, it's uh, on anti-gravity. I haven't been able to put it down. It's, praise the Lord. It's, it's exciting. So, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, just give you a little dictionary help here. You know, a neurotic is somebody who worries about things that didn't happen in the past instead of worrying about things that won't happen in the future. You think I don't know what I'm talking about. You know, when I came back from Vietnam, they sent me to a, for a psych evaluation. It was a, pro, it was a procedure. And uh, I'm surprised that I didn't get out right then, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, they decided I might be a little neurotic, but I wasn't totally insane. So it all, it all worked out real well. You know, I used to play golf. I saw it this week. In fact, we, what day was it? Fri uh, Thursday? Friday? What, whatever day it was. I had the pleasure of going shopping with my wife. I had to pray through a couple of times, but we made it. It was all good. And, no, I really don't mind. It's just I'm not a shopper, so I just kind of hang out. And especially when you're in a women's store. It's awkward. You never know where to stand. You know, you're standing around thinking you're being just indiscreet or being discreet. And you look over and you realize you're standing right next to the women's dressing room and everybody's and they're thinking you're just kind of hovering there for a reason. 
I can tell you this much, all you can see is about that much of their feet. I wasn't looking, I'm just saying, I walked by and you, you can't help, but you know. Praise the Lord. So anyway, on the way, we saw these guys out on the golf course over Terrace Hills. And I mean, it's the first day it hasn't been raining and the snow's finally off the golf course. I get it, you know, they're crazy. They want to get out there and play the game. And I used to play golf. In fact, I just gave my, I had three sets of golf clubs. One set, a friend of mine that worked at the Wakanda Golf Club made for me years ago. And I used those quite a bit. And then I had a brother who passed away and he gave, left me his clubs, which were some really expensive, nice clubs, and I used them a few times. And then I had an old set of Wilsons that I'd had since, I don't know, since the first time I played golf, probably back in high school or somewhere. But anyway, I used to play golf. I wasn't ever very good. And part of the reason I wasn't good, because most of the people you play golf with are so intense, it's not fun. Right. You know, I mean, they're blowing their clubs out there and cussing and ranting and raving, chasing each other, trying to run into each other with the golf carts. and. I mean, it's just not a fun thing. But I, I realize this. The, the, I don't know if you know this, but the Scots are the ones who invented golf. And I decided that maybe that also explains why they invented scotch. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So if you ever played the game or drank scotch, you'd know there's a kind of a, some kind of symbiotic relationship there of some kind. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, God bless you all for being here. And... Uh, Let's go to John chapter 5, and I want to read beginning at verse 37, Peter. And I'm going to read all the way through 47. I've got a couple of uh, uh, scriptures here to open with, and they're both uh, a little lengthy, but bear with me. Praise the Lord. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you won't come to me, that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. Now he's talking to these religious people, right? I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do you not think that I will accuse you to the Father? There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For, he, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you, how shall you believe my words? Praise the Lord. Again, these are the religious leaders that he's talking to. And you got to understand, too, in, in Israel, this was a culture. It wasn't just a religion. The religion permeated every aspect of their culture. And so this is, he's speaking to them religiously, but he's also speaking to them culturally. All right? Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 29. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> I hear, Am is it Ambrosia? Ambrosia. Ambrosia. Beautiful name. Beautiful little girl. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now he's talking to the same people. Right? To preach, or the same group of people, to the preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. All bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. 29, I'm sorry, did I, I don't know what I. Yeah, it's 18 through 29. Yeah, right. You want me to get past 4 to 29? No, just keep going through the. Yeah, I did. It didn't advance. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country, but I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, 
when the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. Now, uh, you have to excuse my dyslexia here, but I didn't realize you had flipped the, the, the scriptures yet. But the point I'm trying to make is these are the same people, the same group of people that he was talking to in the scripture that we read from John. And he's talking to them now about why they're not seeing what God has promised them in his word. Because he's talking about these are, these are countries that are, Capernaum was not a Jewish area. It was Gentile. So he's saying these miracles are being done there, right? I tell you, many widows were, healed, were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up six years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah, Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Again, a, a Gentile area. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, but none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian, another Gentile. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Now they're mad. They were special. Now they're not special because this stuff isn't happening for them like it should. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him in to the brow of a hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. Now get it. Jesus is the epitome of all that they had as far as the scriptures in the Old Covenant. But they had no clue. So he shows up to present to them the reality of what they had been scripturalized to for a thousand years, two thousand years, whatever it had been, several thousand years, and their culture and their religion blinded them to the reality of what Jesus was trying to reveal to them, which is God, yes. which is the truth of all the scriptures that they had, that they had, through their cultural way of looking at things, they had changed them. They changed the meaning. They had changed the, the reality of them, okay? So now I'm saying, I, I, bef just to preface before I go on, I'm not against technology. I'm not a big fan. I mean, I don't do, I'm not against it. I'm just not that interested in it, okay? So this isn't, but this isn't me attacking that. I don't have a problem with it. My wife uses it, Facebook and stuff. Uh, family, obviously, everybody does these days. But... I want you to see that there is something there that interferes with reality. It's a cultural issue that is affecting spiritual truths Amen. on all different levels. That's all I'm saying. So I'm not telling you, burn your computer. You know, I'm not saying, you know, don't go on Facebook. I'm just, I'm just saying, okay, praise the Lord. So here I, I want to start with this. Soren... Uh, Kierkegaard, which is one of my favorite writers, you've heard me quote him before, but I've got several books of his. And uh, he was a philosopher, and this is, this is what he said. It is the duty of the human understanding to understand that there are things which it cannot understand. And what those things are. Now, that obviously is a paradox. I love those things. Because it's life. Contradictions. Things that look like they're contradicting each other, and yet... It's only because we don't understand them. And he goes on to say, human understanding has vulgarly occupied itself with nothing but understanding. But if it would only take the trouble to understand itself at the same time, it would simply have to assume as fact the paradox. Yes. So here's some statistics for you that bear this out. And they come from... Uh, Forbes magazine, from CNN, from Psychology Today, and a couple others that I don't even remember. But here's what they write. The equivalent of 500 years of video are watched on Facebook every day. I'm going to repeat that because it doesn't sound normal. The equivalent of 500 years of video are watched on Facebook every day. 100 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. That's a daily amount of more than 16 years worth of videos every 24 hours. The average mobile phone user checks his or her phone 150 times a day. There was a nine-fold 
increase in the amount of digital information created and shared in the last five years. Nine times whatever it was. The English version of Wikipedia alone, just the English version, grows at a rate of 700 articles per day. When we find ourselves surrounded by change, the natural reaction is to try to keep up. The internet and social media make it seem impossible to keep up. But reality is, it's a distraction. See, you know, you think, I said that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse myself. Because what happens is, all that information is there, so it makes you think, I can absorb all this. If I could just get enough information, right, this will work, right? I can, I can make it happen. So the, the, the idea of the social media and all of these uh, available uh, information makes you think that I, I could actually learn it all. If I spend enough time, you know, I'll get all the information I could possibly use. The truth is, it's actually distracting. Amen. Workers are interrupted every 10.5 minutes by a social media notification. It then takes them 23 minutes for those employees to get back on task. That is $650 billion of work hours a year. $650 billion of work hours. Which is more than seven times the amount of money lost due to smoking breaks and more than the combined value of Google and Chevron. That's just checking an email, you know, getting an update from somebody. So in other words, multitasking without discipline has the potential to reprogram us for, dist for distraction. We love the ability to focus and filter out irrelevant information. The problem is we lose that when we're totally absorbed by the information network. The problem with more and more information is that we can end up knowing less and less. So let me ask you a rhetorical question here. Is this manic kind of raging drive to know and understand everything biblical? Well, not according to Ecclesiastes. Now, you can go there, uh, Peter, if you want to. It's Ecclesiastes 4 and 8, but I'm going to read a little different translation. This is actually a new English, I believe, version. There was a man all alone. This is Ecclesiastes 4 and 8. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless. A miserable business, he says. Then in Ecclesiastes 12.12, 12, he says, Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now, we know that Proverbs is always talking about, you know, hard work will get the job done, early bird gets the worm, and all those kinds of things. He didn't say that, but I mean, that's the kind of the impression that you get. So look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, where he says, Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the ones who understand obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying. The words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So is Solomon contradicting himself because he wrote Ecclesiastes and now he's speaking in Proverbs? Or is there a principle of rhythm? Somehow something that we've missed in these scriptures. Look at Exodus chapter 20 now, Peter, verse 8 through 10. Bear with me. I know I'm a little slow going here, but praise God. Exodus 20, verse 8 through 10. He says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do not, not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. 
So Solomon was actually trying to explain in Ecclesiastes that enough is enough. Praise the Lord. He was presenting a principle of rhythm, rest and trust. Praise God. And that was the way to resolve this paradox of thinking that you have to understand everything without ever understanding yourself and your motive. Amen. God loves us for who we are. Period. He has grace for us. We can, we can just be children loved by a compassionate father. Amen. That little girl on Tim's lap doesn't have to do anything for Tim to love her. No. Doesn't have to do anything for him to protect her, to provide for her, to look out for her. Right? She doesn't have to do anything. Why? Because he loves her. He, she's perfect. Uh -huh. Right? She's my baby. That's how God looks at us. So do you want to please God? Just spend time with Him. Yes. Sometimes we just need more God and less information. Yes. Yes. More information is not the solution to an overload of information. That's right. Stepping out of the current is the answer. Uh -huh. Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. Yes. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. <clears throat> well, you can think I'm just a dolt and whatever, but the, tr the truth is I don't watch news. Sally does. And likes to give me an update every once in a while. I watch the weather. They're lying too, but I mean, at least I can verify it within a matter of hours. I'm just going to look out the window. So I do watch the weather, but I don't, I don't watch the news. I'm just telling you. Catch a little bit of sports once in a while or the, or, and the weather, and that's it. You cannot help but hear what's on the news without watch. You don't have to watch the news because somebody's going to tell you about it anyway. You'll catch a glimpse of it through the radio through some television program, an update will come on, or the new, you know, if you happen to still pick up a newspaper once in a while like I do, although they're few and far between, they're much cheaper than they used to be. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But I'm just saying. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So if we spend all of our time trying to hear God through the cultural noise and the religious cacophony that's going on around us, the message is obscured and it becomes confusing because you're getting a lot of opposite information. Praise the Lord. Uh, skewed information. In fact, I saw, I was watching yesterday, on, I don't even know what channel it was, but there, there's a new Jesus movie coming up and it's like a four-week History Channel, that was it. Uh, it's a four-week thing. And I'm just, I'll watch it probably, just because I like to find all the faults. <laughs> no, not, re not really. I'd love it to be accurate, but I just know that it won't be because I haven't seen one yet that has been. The closest thing I think would probably Mel Gibson's, you know, the, 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 the passion. But, but that had its kind of weirdness too. But it was closer. It was more like the, the, the truth. But most of them are just so culturized to our 21st century way of thinking that they've lost all the, the real impact and meaning of it. So anyway, if, if that's what we do, then the message is confusing and, it, and it's obscure. But Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if Jesus' way constitutes a model for us of some kind, then we have to be able to live into it. Are you with me? If he says my yoke is easy... My burden is light. That He's giving us a, a model for how to live. And if He is, then there has to be for, a way for us to literally live into that reality. Or, or He'd be a liar and just uh, you know, tempting us to fail by even in, at, at mentioning it in the first place. Amen. So look at this, Matthew chapter 14 now, verse 24 through 31, Peter. So I don't know how, how can anybody get it through life today 
not feeling burdened, not feeling weighted down, not feeling overwhelmed, not feeling, you know, wore out and exhausted by doing nothing but just listening to the news. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Jesus said, if you come to me, you'll see the things will begin to lighten up. Yes. Make me the focus. And the other stuff will fade away. Praise the Lord. So, but, the, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come to thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was uh, come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Praise the Lord. Amen. So we can make our way through the eye of a hurricane, which is what it feels like literally to live close to God in a chaotic world. Yeah. Think about it for a minute. Mm -hmm. The closer you are to God, the closer you are to living the way God tells us we can live, the more chaotic it seems around you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. There are, there are realities. There are realities of God in the middle of confusion. Peter was in the midst of a confusion, in the midst of a frightening, out of control situation for him personally. But he focused on Jesus. He came to Jesus. The moment he stopped coming to Jesus and started listening to the cultural noise or to the chaos that was going on around him, the chaos took over. Yeah. And he begins to sink. He cries out and Jesus spares him. He delivers him from it, but he still got wet. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He didn't drown, but he still began to sink. Hallelujah. We have to wrestle with the realities of God in the middle of confusion because that's what the life of faith means. It doesn't mean you get a free pass. It doesn't mean that there are no opposition that, or that there is no uh, pushback. It just means that the realities of God... You find them in the midst of confusion usually. True. Praise the Lord. You're looking for some peace. You're looking for some, some sense to be made out of the whole situation. And so we have to wrestle with them because that's what faith does. So there is the principle that we talked about that I think uh, Solomon was trying to get across to us. And that is rest and trust. And waiting. There is a reality available to us. A reality of God. Wanting to still us. Our soul. You know our thinking. Our emotions. Our feelings. Amen. And by that to lead us. Because if he doesn't calm us down he can't get us to go anywhere. Rest is the cultural dramamine. Amen. That we need to navigate the culture that we live in. Praise the Lord. This cultural landscape, I mean, it's exhausting. In order to navigate it, we have to know what it looks like. All right? C.S. Lewis wrote many books, one of which is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And it begins like this. I love this. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. goes on to say, a dull, unimaginative, contentious child, Eustace had read only the wrong books. So if we let culture influence us through the media, uh -huh. through conversations, through religion, through upbringing, and all the other possibilities, sure. we become distracted. Yeah. We end up clouding meaningful topics with meaningless ideas. Anyone ever notice that chicken is never mentioned in the Old Testament? 
You say, my God, Nathan, you've got way too much time on your hands. It's a word search. It doesn't take long to figure out. Chicken is not in the Bible. Now, it's weird because with all of its rules, this is what got me thinking about in the first place, with all of the rules about clean and unclean animals, you got pigeons, you got doves, you got quail, what to eat, when to eat, how to eat, nothing about chicken. The reason? Nobody ate chicken in the Middle East. There were no chickens in the Middle East. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The red jungle fowl is the ancestor of modern chickens. And it was only found in India. Praise the Lord. So if we, if we tried to interpret the Bible's silence about chicken as intentional or meaningful in some way, we'd be missing the whole reason the silence is there in the first place. Yeah. It was silence because why would you be talking about something you didn't know anything about? Right. If you've never seen a chicken, it wasn't like they heard about them you know, on the radio, they just never got to eat one. Yeah. No, they didn't, as far as they knew, they did, there was no such thing as a chicken. They wouldn't have been, the thought would have never come to their mind. Right. So what's a... This got to do with anything. Amen. Look, think about Rome, the culture, the, the dominant culture of their time. Uh -huh. what, what do we see from the Bible about Rome? It was violent, it was oppressive, it was anti Christ, it was a lot of things, right? But what happens is we miss so much of the Roman culture because all we see is a, a sliver of it. I'm not saying it was a great thing. I'm just saying it had a lot of good things. It had, it, they built roads. They had communication skills and, and uh, trading skills, all sorts of economic uh, things going on that were all positives mm -hmm. as long as you were Roman. Right. Praise the Lord. But here's the deal. We flatten contemporary culture in our brain just like we try to flatten the fact that there's no chicken in there if you'd never thought of that before. You try, if you'd read and said, well, there's no... Why, why is there no chicken in here? What's the deal with chicken? Does God hate chicken so bad that he won't even speak the word? Is it that horrible? Or You know, I mean, we, just, we would start trying to come up with some reason for why it's not there. And all of our reasons would probably be wrong. Right? Because we'd be basing them on, we've got chicken every day. Right? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. I mean, that's, you know, it's everywhere. What we really need these days is not an increase in provocative conclusions, but a growth in compelling explanations. Praise the Lord. The death of spiritual or, or just deep conversation leaves us victims to the tyranny of triviality. I mean, I get tired of talking about crap that just doesn't matter. It's trivial. It's meaningless. It's, I don't, it's not that I don't want to have just a friendly conversation once in a while, but 90% of the conversations that are coming to me are things that I'm thinking, what? Who the cares? Yes. I mean, really. It's a distraction. Here's what Thoreau said. Now, he wrote Walden's Pot, all, all these things, but he was talking about... Uh, he wrote a, 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 an essay, and this is just a, a bit of it. He said, life without principle opens like this. Let us consider the way in which we spend our lives. This world is a place of business. What an infinite bustle, he says. It interrupts my dreams. There is no Sabbath. That's what he wrote. If we let ourselves be sucked into anything other than God's kingdom, yeah. we're going to be chasing after the wind. Yeah. Yes. That's the ailment of our culture. Yes. Remember Gone with the Wind? What was Gone with the Wind about? A culture that vanished. Yes. Right? And rightfully so. But that's... We're chasing the wind. We're, we're trying to catch something that's uncatchable. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
That is the ailment of our culture. Mm -hmm. Thinking that we can actually catch the wind. Yeah. Thinking that we can understand everything. Thinking that we, if we get enough information, everything will be fine. Look, we've got more information today than we've ever had in the history of the universe. And we've got more chaos, more confusion, more crime, more sin, more crap yes. than we've ever had. So true. And God said it's going to happen. It's going to get darker. It's going to get so dark. So dark, darkness will cover everything, but the light of God's truth will shine through it. Wow. So instead of looking into other people's lives and making comparisons, maybe we'd be more like Christ if we just nurtured our own lives right. instead of sitting around idly, voyeuristically, not moving, not going forward. See, if we get outside this the trendy thinking of modern culture, uh -huh. we actually become more human. Uh -huh. Because the trendy cult culture says, kill babies. Uh -huh. Kill them before they're born, kill them after they're born, doesn't matter. Mm. They're not part of the culture yet. Right? Uh -huh. Think of all the, the cultural crap that we deal with yeah. that doesn't change one thing. It makes us less human. It makes us more self-conscious, more self-aware, more, more egotistical. Praise the Lord. Ultimately, our anchor point has to be trust. Trust that God is good. Trust that God's in control. Trust enough to act on His word. We have to cling to trust in the goodness of God as we walk out whatever His calling is on our lives. Despite the raging cultural change and hostility to faith that's all around us. I grew up in the 50s. I was born in 48, so I grew up, the majority of my adolescence was in the 50s. I'm telling you, and I suppose it happens with every generation, but I, I can't believe the changes in culture that have taken place in that time. When I was a kid, there were a lot of people that weren't Christians. They just didn't talk about it. Right. You just didn't see them in church. Right. But the truth is, for the most part, not I mean, there were exceptions, obviously, but for the most part, their morality wasn't much different than the people that went to church. Why? Because the culture had established certain mores and right. principles right. that you had to live by. Right. And they were reinforced by everything that we did. Right. Howdy doody, for crying out loud. You know, uh, Roy Rogers and Hop Along. I mean, I, I've watched Lone Ranger reruns within the last year where they talk about praying for somebody. Yes. Believing that God's going to do something. I mean, this is a, a TV show. Prime time. Yeah. And there were many of them like that. Right. But it's all changed. So look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The reason they didn't enter in was because of unbelief. Although... He said the work was finished from the foundation of the world. They didn't have to do anything except enter in. What they were entering into was a finished work. Right? The houses were built. Right? The land was fertile. It had been plowed. It had crops already in it. It was all done. You just, just go. Just take by faith, enter in. Right? My, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You don't have to go... You know, digging up clay to make bricks to build a house. Go cut down trees or pick up thatch. or anything. It's all there. It's waiting for you. You don't have to spend three to five years preparing the ground for the first crop. Just go in and pick the stuff that's already been done. It's already there. All you got to do is just receive it. Just take it. Right? But they didn't enter in. Why? Because they didn't believe. Right. A revelation of the finished work produces faith. If they'd have had a revelation of what he was talking about, they'd have knocked each other down trying to get in. The only requirement of the new covenant is to believe. Right? 
Everything you do from that point on is a result of what you believe. John 6, verse 29. See, we've got people trying to do things to stop doing other things. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, there shouldn't be some self-discipline. Uh, I mean, I believe in self-discipline, Sally will tell you. I, I'm almost manic when it comes to doing certain things. I just do it. I, I don't think about it. I don't go, oh, my God, I've got to do this. I just do it. And I'm not patting myself on the back or anything. I'm just saying that's just the way it is. I'm uncomfortable if I know that there's something that needs to be done and it isn't done, then, then I'm not comfortable until it gets done. In fact, well, enough about me. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on whom he has sent. All right, so the work of God is simply to believe, period. And when we are focused on Jesus, amen, and not distracted by the culture that we find ourselves in, we realize we're at rest. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Here's the example. Okay, this morning, I'm, I'm not ratting anybody out here. Uh, but Sunday is typical. I mean, Sundays are like just a regular day in the sense that we have our routine, right? You know, so I get up and I uh, empty the litter boxes and put down the furniture that we pick up at night to keep the cats off of it, amen, and then uh, feed the outside animal, the birds, and uh, dump the trash and a couple of other little items there. And after that, then I usually go upstairs and I'll have the, some Christian channel on while I go back over my notes again and get ready for church. And so she has TV, the Christian channels on downstairs, and I come down by the time I'm done with all that, then I come down to take a shower. I know you're always fascinated by all this information, aren't you? <laughs> but, um, so I've, and when I'm taking the shower, I'll leave the TV on in the bedroom because, you know, the bathroom's right there, and I can turn it up enough so that, except when I'm in the shower, I can hear it. Only, when I get in there to hear it, it's Channel 13 News. Yeah. Now, that doesn't make Sally a hypocrite. Just makes her a little lax. No, I'm just kidding. No, so I turn the TV on. Why? Not because I'm angry that I couldn't listen to the Christian shows, but because I don't want to listen to the news. I do not want that in my head. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's all negative. Yes, it is. I, it just is. And most of it is not true. It just depends on who's telling it. Right. And it's the same old stuff, you know, day after day after day. And who, I mean, I'm a, I don't care. I'm telling you the truth. I don't care anymore. Uh -huh. I'm going to do the best I can do to be what I think a good American ought to be. And it's not because I'm a good American. I'm talking about being a good human being. It just happens to live in America. Okay? And I don't need all this other negative crap that just goes on and on and on. And all it tells me is how idiotic and how angry and how frustrated and how shallow yes. Yes. the people are that are running this country that are in charge. My God, if I believe that, I, it's no wonder the suicide rate's what it is. I'm surprised there aren't more people leaving here to go to Mexico than there are people leaving Mexico to get here. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just nuts. Well, now, Sally, is, it's not like she's sacrilegious or anti-Christ. She just listened to like three or four Christian shows, and she just wanted to see, I'm sure, what the weather was. Although, to listen to the weather, you've got to listen to about half hour of everything else because they keep teasing you with the weather because they know that's the only reason any of us watch. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So the work of God is simply to believe. And when we're focused on Jesus and not distracted by the culture, you'll find yourself at peace, at rest. How many of you ever try it? It's the truth. It just is. All right, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 12 through 16, Peter. Sorry. 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Praise the Lord. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So whatever your battle is, whatever your struggle is, whatever you're going through, let me point you to the one who's going to give rest to you. Because we all know that every work of God isn't instantaneous. Sometimes they're lifelong. So you better learn the rhythm Amen. That Solomon was trying to teach us. Praise the Lord. Rest. Praise God. Let me show you the context of the scripture where Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. What, what's the context in which he's actually saying this? Because a lot of times we lose that. We just pick out a scripture and quote the scripture and forget, okay, what... What the heck was going on around him when he said this, right? So let me show you the context here where Jesus offers rest in Matthew chapter 11, Peter, verses 16 through 27. Matthew 11, 16 through 27. Praise the Lord. Okay, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. And they're saying, we piped unto you and you have not danced. We've mourned unto you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, he's got a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So it's, you can see the context is almost like Luke 4, where they want to kill him. Because it starts out sounding really good. He's going to give them liberty, and then he tells them how much more they could have had if they would have just got past their religion or past their cultural institutions and beliefs, praise the Lord. So they say, you didn't dance to our mu music. You're not meeting our criteria. You're not politically correct. Praise the Lord. And here's what Jesus had to say, verse 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And he's, it goes on to talk about there remains a rest for the children of God. Praise the Lord. What's the purpose? If there's a rest that remains for us, they, they didn't enter into theirs, 
right? But there's one that remains for us. So what's the purpose of it? All right. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember, thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. We stand in Christ. He is the favored ground. Praise the Lord. He is wherever Abram put his foot. He's that to us. Right? Praise the Lord. So a perpetual day of favor and grace. Praise the Lord. That's what, that's what this is about. Now all this stuff in the Old Covenant talking about the Sabbath day and keeping it holy and rest. It's talking about Jesus. It's really not... See, again, we're dealing with the chicken, right? Or the fowl. He, chicken's not talked about. Why? Because it's not relevant. The Sabbath is spoken of because it's only relevant in the context of Jesus, of the understanding of what it's talking about. You can... You can just sit in your living room on, the, on Sundays. Don't turn on the TV. Don't turn on the lights. Don't eat anything. Don't cook anything. Don't talk to anybody. And you're not holy. You're right. doofus. You're, you're weird. Yeah. Right? Because that's not what the Sabbath is about. That's what we've made it about. But that is not what it's about. It's about Jesus. Yeah. It was from the very beginning. Before the foundation of God. Before the foundation of the world, I should say. God, or Christ was in God, amen, yes. taking care of all of our issues that we would have someday down the road. Right. Amen. Yes. It wasn't ever about, don't do these things. The don't doing of those things was pointing us to Him taking care of all the things that we did that we could not do. Right. Couldn't not do. Right. Are you with yes. Praise the Lord. So, the rest that remains for the children of God. And the purpose of it is a perpetual day of favor and grace. Set free from slavery in order to possess our inheritance. Slaves don't get inheritances. That's right. That's right. Servants don't get the inheritance. That's why he says a child is no different than a servant. They can't get the inheritance. Right. They have to mature. Right? So we're set free from slavery in order to possess the inheritance that God intended for us in Christ. Before the foundation of the world. Amen. To regain your family. Yes. We read it. Yes. To be restored to your rightful place. Mm -hmm. To possess, again, your inheritance. That's what the Sabbath is for. Praise the Lord. And all of this flows from rest. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen because of what they did. It happened because of what God did. And He said, now rest on the Sabbath day because you're acknowledging mm -hmm. what that Sabbath represents. Mm -hmm. Jesus, who has delivered us from all sin, from all judgment, right. from all correction, from all punishment, right. and replaced us back in the original position of God being the source and meeting all of our needs according to His riches and glory in spite of what's going on around us. Amen. Has nothing to do with that unless we make that the priority. Then this becomes a distraction. Yes. Yes. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 and 23. So there's, there is some truth to the idea of ignorance being bliss. Now, not ignorant of everything, but some things I just soon not know. Exactly. There's things I know today that I wish I didn't know. Because right. it makes me think about stuff I don't want to think about. Right. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, 
for he is faithful that promised. Now look, it's possible to go to college and get a business degree and never have received one minute of teaching from somebody who ever owned a business or ever ran a business or even worked in a business. Our culture values ideas above experience and results. That's just the truth of it. That's why they're willing to try anything. Let's murder babies up to a year old because it makes sense to us who have been killing them you know, earlier for a long time. Now this seems like the logical next step, right? Or pick any one of the millions of idiotic ridiculous things that are being passed off as rational, normal human behavior and we look at it and go, what in the world? What, what world are these people from? That this seems normal. That this looks natural to them. Acceptable. Something we would even want to promote. I mean, are there not enough issues in the world that we got? We got some guy running around out here that says the first thing we got to do is fix fix global warming. I'll tell you how to fix it. Come to Iowa in February, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they just changed the rules of the game. It's not global warming anymore. Now it's climate change. Why? Because the global warming thing blew up in our face and made us look like idiots. So now we're just going to call it climate change, so that no matter what it does, we can draw it under our umbrella of knowledge and genius. If you might recall, the guy who started a lot of this was an idiot. Yes. I hope I don't offend anybody, but his name was Al Gore. He was a vice president. You know the story about that, right? There was two guys, two brothers. One of them grew up to be president. And everybody thought he was the greatest thing on earth. The other grew up and became vice president and was never heard of again. You know, the vice president really doesn't have a lot to do. And even if he did, he couldn't do it. So that's why he's vice president. Praise God. Sorry. See, I have watched this stuff in the past. I'm just not, I'm just saying, I'm not watching it anymore. And this is why, because it just, it just irritates me. Praise the Lord. The problem is, I wish that the fact that you could go to college and get information from people who don't have any basis for the reason why they would have the information in the first place. But it doesn't limit, it doesn't end, amen, there. I wish it did. But the culture that values ideas above experience has also shaped most of the Bible schools, the seminaries, the denominations. But the bottom line is this. God cannot be known outside of experience. You can know your religion. You can be extremely religious. You can be outrageously religious and not even have an experience in God. But you cannot know God. By, by His own definition, you can't know Him without experiencing Him. Amen. God is a person. He's not a philosophy. He's not a religion. He's not a concept. He is a person. John said He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So He tells us exactly where He was when he got this revelation. Yes. He was in the Lord's day. Yes. In the spirit. Yes. The scripture says in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son. Uh -huh. Now we want to think of that chronologically obviously. Because that's we're stuck here. We're human beings. You know we're spirits. But we're in a world that was created with time. Mm -hmm. we're, that, that's not our natural way. Our natural way is eternal. Because we're spirits. Yes. But because we have flesh, we're in a time world. We're in a place where there are beginnings and endings. We're in a, a, a timeline like. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. But understand this. We can see the Lord's day 
as more than just a chronological day. If a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, then we ought to be able to understand the times and the seasons and see them playing out chronologically in God. Not in our culture. We have to understand, if you're going to get, the, you got to get it in a trans-temporal way. Now, I'm not trying to be intentionally obtuse here. I'm just saying, you have to see there's, there's, cha there's a change, there's a transition. When you're born again, you're alive again to the Spirit whom you were all along. You're brought back, you could say you're taken back to God before the foundation of the world where you were created in the first place. The problem is, we don't connect with that until we die. We're still trying to work things out through the culture rather than through God, which is the whole reason why we got born again and didn't die the moment we got born again. Praise the Lord. It, my point is this. These, these thousand years with the Lord and, and uh, a day is the same as a thousand. These... The fact that God is uh, a spirit and no man has seen him and that he is the beginning and the end and doesn't exist in time. All of those things, is that they don't speak to exclusive or exclusively of a particular time. They're not talking about a particular time span like from 1900 to 1940 or something. They're, that's not what it's about. But that Jesus Christ himself is the day of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? We read it one way because of culture, because of the way we live, because of our life, because of time and space and all these things. But that's not how it was written. The Spirit of the Lord wrote this. It was God breathed. God's Spirit moved on somebody and they wrote according to the Spirit, not according to their intellect or according to the culture that they lived in. Yes. Praise the Lord. He is our Sabbath. He is the one who brought us into rest because He bore our judgment. He took away the need for us to be doing to get. Now we rest in faith. You only have to act when He tells you to act. Come with me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And here's the deal. When you enter into the day of the Lord... We cease from our labor. And we enter into the very rest of God. Jesus Christ is the true Sabbath. Everything else is a picture. Everything else is just something pointing to the reality. The fact that we're here celebrating the Sabbath. We're not here celebrating because it's Sunday. We're here because it's Jesus. The reason from the time we open the doors until we close them yes. to be here is to celebrate Jesus. Yes. Yes. Is to tell Him, we trust You. Yes. Enough to get up on Sunday morning, yes. come to cross town, come to this little building on the east side, wade through a muddy parking lot or snow drifts or whatever it might be. Why? Because we know we'll find rest yes. in the presence of the Lord. We know that if we push the culture back for 24, because I guarantee you, the culture right now is saying, you morons, eight of you? And this little dive on the east side, wading through mud, and what, what's the point? It's not cultural. It's personal. It's spiritual. Praise the Lord. Colossians 2, verse 16 and 17. I don't feel intimidation by the culture. I feel sympathy. I'm serious. I'm not intimidated by the culture. They're idiots. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm not trying to be vicious. I'm just saying logic alone would dictate. Vast majority of every, all this is just stupid. It's just ignorant. And you can get up and argue with a politician, but I've said it many times, and somebody much wiser than me coined the phrase, and that is, Argue with a fool, and you have two fools arguing. That's why these, you know, the political debates and stuff, I just, I can't stand it. It's like fingernails on a chalkboard. It's like, who are these idiots? 
Where do they come from? Exactly. Who stole our country? You know, I mean, it's just insane. You're thinking, who, does, does, are there people out there that really believe what they're saying yeah. is true? Yeah. Or believe that they believe what, what they're saying is true? Yeah. Makes me just want to slap them for, for thinking that I could be so ignorant and so naive to just because somebody gets up and I'm going to, you're going to want to vote for me. You know why? Because I tell the truth. Yeah. Oh, of course you do. Well, then please let me vote for you and give you all my money too. Because you tell the truth. I know you do because you said you did. And it was on Facebook. It's on the internet. It must be true. They got a website now. So let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. You can do all that other stuff. And he said, for what? If you don't get the, the truth of what that was about, then you're just you're spinning your wheels for nothing. Right. Yeah, you're, you're doing a bunch of stuff that may look good to the culture around you. May you look just like, well, a religious person, but, you know. Uh -huh. But you've missed the whole point. Exactly. Again, it's, it's wondering why isn't there anything about fried chicken in the Bible? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've been eating it all these years and now I find out. What the? Come on, Lord. Talk to me about chicken. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day for, or of the new moon or the Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is Christ. So here's what he's saying. Jesus Christ is the body or the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Everything else is just what we make up. It's what culture mixed with religion has tried to produce and then perpetrate on us as something that's going to change us or make us better. Or actually what it does is conform us to the culture that's around us. So we, even though we may have different uh, values, the means by which we express them are identical. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so... He's the fulfillment. He's the body, it says, which they're talking about. He is the fulfillment of the previous scripture, which is, there were no numbers when this stuff was written. No verses, no chapters, just continuous writing, which is what Bible means. Let no man therefore judge you in the meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day. So he's saying the religious rules, your cultural laws, have nothing to do with Jesus. He is the fulfillment of whatever the other stuff is you've been doing trying to get to him. He's the fulfillment of all that. You can stop that stuff and get Jesus. So he says he, he, the body is Christ. So the, the fulfillment, amen, he is the body or the fulfillment of the Sabbath. He's also then the jubilee. Praise the Lord. In, in Luke 4, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Amen. To set at liberty them that are bound to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee. Yes. Yes. So he's identifying himself with these realities. Yes. And then they were all right with it until he went on to say, why? You're not experiencing it. And then they got mad because he went outside of their cultural paradigm. Praise the Lord. When the finished work of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection is revealed, you are beholding the day of the Lord. The day you got born again, the day you accepted that He died for you, that He was buried for you, and that He rose again, you were crucified with Him, you were buried with Him, and you rose together with Him and are seated with Him in heavenly places. The moment you accepted that, yes. praise the Lord, you entered in yes. to the Sabbath day. Yes. You entered in to the rest of God. Yes. Because of the finished work that dealt with all of the rest of your crap that had to be dealt with. He dealt with it so you could rest from your labor and receive your inheritance. But you have to rest and trust and wait.
If there were no waiting, there would be no need for trusting. There'd be no need for faith. Praise the Lord. Once you behold it, you can enter into it. See, that's the problem with religion. They get the information. Right? And they'll get more and more information every week. But they never get the revelation. So they're just parroting the things that they've heard without experiencing them. What the day of the Lord is saying, what Jesus is literally telling us, He is the Sabbath. He is the day of the Lord. And so this day is proclaiming that you are no longer in Adam. But you are in Christ. That revelation enables you to cease from your labor. Wasn't it? Adam didn't have anything to do. Except receive until he chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then he had to start working. And man's been working ever since. Uh Jesus came so we could go back to the garden, back to the place where God is our source. And we want to keep working. Mm -hmm. So we treat him like a second job. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9, verse 28. We're just about done here. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Last scripture here. Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. So religion and culture are about multitasking. And that programs us for distraction. More information isn't the answer. We need to apply the principle of the the rhythm principle of rest and trust. And live into this reality. There was a boy called Nathan Hamlin, and I almost deserved it. Read all the wrong books, followed all the wrong rules, Mm -hmm. did all the wrong things. But I've been given a new name, Jesus. Rest. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Don't know your name? I probably do. But in general. And you probably deserve it. Almost. But God gave you a new one. You don't have to labor. You just have to rest. And receive your inheritance. Praise the Lord. And all that rightfully belongs to you in Christ. Your family, your spouse, your children, your children's children, your grandchildren's children. You don't think about that until you start getting older. And then you start thinking, you know what? I never thought I'd see the day I'd be holding a great grandchild in my arms. But you know what? If this world keeps on spinning, there'll be great, 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 great grandchildren that I will not hold in my arms. But the one that I'm holding in my arms today may be holding them in their arms. And they can tell them. The same things that I learned. They can learn those same things. God wants them to understand. He wants to make it right. And he told us in Deuteronomy. This is not just for you. I'm taking you when you were a servant. A slave. And I'm going to make you a free person. Give you your inheritance. All that you have need of. And your family as well. And our family isn't limited to two or three generations. My family was going on long before I got here, all the way back to Adam, and it'll keep on going until Jesus comes. Praise the Lord. And God's depending on each generation to bring truth and revelation to the next generation. Or we lose it all. And we're seeing the example all around us where this has failed, 
where people have not done what the scripture told them. And now we have a nation built with all kinds of rules and regulations and laws. And they think that they can legislate morality. They think they can legislate the right behavior. It won't happen. No matter how many laws we pass, no matter how much the punishment is for breaking those laws, people will continue to do it until they come to Jesus, until they get past the culture and to the person of Christ. Yes. And that will change everything. Yes. Praise the Lord. If you don't believe me, read the end of the book because it happens. Yeah. It happens and it's all good Amen. when we all get to Jesus. Yes. Amen. Give him one more hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. So God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.